This is She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. Your host, Kinsey Roberts, interviews incredible women in the wedding industry who are making their mark and creating success on their terms. Join the conversation. Hello, and welcome to episode 125 of She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. This is your host, as always, Kinsey Roberts. Thanks so much for being here today. Hope you're having a great day. I'm looking forward to today's episode. We are chatting about setting ourselves up for success in 2019. And the next four episodes, so episode 125 through 129, the next four episodes here are really going to be about things we can do to prepare well for this year that we're in now. If you're listening to this, in real time. It's just now the start of the year and I think it's a great time now that the holidays are over to really reflect and see what went well and what didn't go well last year. And if you're listening to this sometime in the future, it's never a bad time to evaluate what you're doing in your business and your strategy. So feel free to go through these steps no matter what part of the year that you're in. I think it's a good time to do that anytime, even if everything's working for you. It's great just to reaffirm yourself. So let me kind of give you the outline for today's episode. First, I'm going to take you through a few questions that you can ask yourself for what worked for you this year and what didn't work for you. And then we're going to go through three main categories of your business, finances, marketing, and your client process, which for me, the client process, when I say that includes onboarding, nurturing, and offboarding. So I'm going to take you through those three sections of your business and share some ways you can audit those sections uh, to have a better year in 2019, hopefully. Now, disclaimer to this episode and to all episodes, I am not 100% perfect at any of this. I am not the most organized human being, but I'm always trying to get better. And I always like to continue to learn ways to improve my business and ways to organize better, ways to improve these processes. So that's what I'm taking you through. I'm not telling you, you know, it's not a finger shake today, like you need to do these things. It's just, hey, here's some stuff you can think about if improving 2019 is on your list. And, you know, maybe we can do that together. All right. So before I dive in, I just wanted to quickly let you know that Again, I'm still getting emails because it's the first of the year, and I think that kind of coincides with goals and things of that nature. I'm still getting emails for folks who missed the last opening of the Venue Academy in October 2018, and if that was you, you can hop on the wait list. It's going to open again this year. My website's kind of getting a facelift right now, so it's just a landing page, but I included the link to the Venue Academy waitlist, so just go to shecreatesbusinesspodcast.com, click on the Venue Academy waitlist, and hop on that list. So shecreatesbusinesspodcast.com, literally the only action on that landing page is the Venue Academy waitlist, so super easy to find. Okay, let's dive in. Here are a couple of questions to ask yourself for what actually worked for you this year. And when you are taking yourself through these questions, I really want you to try to have some data to back up what worked for you. And in fact, data is going to come up a lot in in this whole episode. And I think it's really important. Let me back up a little bit. Fat or feelings and the way things made us feel and all of that is really important. But sometimes we need to stop being so precious about our business and stop being like, oh, that didn't make me feel good. Uh, and we really just need to be professional and say that didn't, it wasn't great, but it totally worked to get 10 new clients. So how can I make it make me feel better, but I still need to do it because I'm just a professional. You know what I mean? I hope that makes sense. I'm not saying that we should be doing things that make us feel like horrible humans, but it's really important that sometimes we just step back and act like professionals and stop trying to make everything, you know, like align perfectly with our emotions and passions. Sometimes you just got to dig in and get stuff done. You know what I mean? Okay. So Let's talk about what worked for you in 2019. Question, did social media work for you? And I don't mean you felt bogged down by it. Maybe you did, and we'll get to that. But did it work? Did you actually book clients from social media? That's a question to ask yourself. I want to know if it worked for you. Or did you make a connection on social media that led to a really fulfilling or profitable or both um partnership or something like that. Maybe you started a conference together. I don't know. Decide. Did social media actually work for you? 
Did in-person networking work for you? Maybe you made a commitment to go to more in-person networking meetings or events this year, such as WIPA or NACE or conferences throughout the country. Did that work for you? Do you feel good about that? Do you know that you made connection there? Did you gain a client or multiple clients from it? Did it contribute to your bottom line? Or is it something that helped you take a break in the season that helped you show up better for your couples in the second half of your season? That has value. I know I just said we can't judge everything by feelings, but we do need some data. It can't just be like, oh, that didn't feel good, so I'm not going to do it again. Did it feel good, but did it not really work and it was a waste of your time, right? Sometimes I think in-person networking can be that way. It can be it was super fun, but then I came back home and I had a ton of work to do. So it wasn't a great time of year to go. You know what I mean? So did in-person networking work for you? And what kind of in-person networking worked for you? Did having some automation in place in your business work for you? Were you, did you automate some inquiry emails? Did you automate some education to your couples? Did you automate some, you know, even just basic, was this the first year that you took a vacation? And so you set up an automated reply that made you enjoy your vacation more. Did automation work for you? What automation worked for you? List those out and list out why it worked for you. Did it help you get back to your couples faster? Did it give them something to chew on before you could answer their very specific questions but did not leave them hanging and so they felt taken care of? Why did the automation work for you? And then the last question, and these are not the only questions, I just want to get your brain turning. Did paid advertising work for you? Did you boost some Facebook posts? Did you run some Instagram ads? Are you doing Google ads? And are they working for you? This on it is one place where it's not about feeling, it's about data. You can dig into your Facebook insights, which are also your Instagram insights, and figure out if paid advertising worked for you and find out if you want to continue to invest in that location of your business. That's one of the things I love about paid advertising. I am not a 100% pro at it and I'm still learning, but I run ads and they work for us. We book clients from them. I'll give you an example here once we get to the marketing section of this episode, but I... I'm still learning. I don't know. I don't know everything. But one thing I love about paid advertising is that it is hardcore data. I can just decide by the numbers if it's working or not, and I can change my advertising method. It's not about, oh, did it feel good to run an Instagram ad? You know what I mean? So did paid advertising work for you? So let's talk about what didn't work for you now. Let's talk, do what worked for you first, set yourself up for success in that way. And then now let's talk about what didn't work for you. So same question as above, did social media not work for you? Did you feel completely overwhelmed and bogged down by it? We'll get to that in the marketing section, I promise. Did it not work for you? Were you very consistent, but you gained zero clients from social media? I don't know. You decide. Did it not work for you? And why didn't it work for you? And really try to focus on the data here. I highly encourage that. Did traveling too much become a habit in 2018 and that just did not work for you? I made a commitment not to do any traveling for business in 2019 except for what's already planned. I have a few things that are already planned and other than that, I'm not traveling at all unless it's for an actual vacation. Uh, So did you travel too much? Did it interrupt your flow in life and business and it really was hard to get back into the swing of things when you got back? Figure that out. Finances. Did finances not work for you? I know finances feel hard. They feel intimidating to me. I am. I feel like I'm learning to be a better numbers person, but they do feel intimidating because I am looking for ways to increase our revenue at the venue. I do want to make more money. And so they, they kind of fall in both camps. I feel proud of us for what we've done, but I also feel like, gosh darn it, I don't feel like it worked as well when the finances section as maybe it should be or it could be and, you know, quote, should be. I don't have anything to compare it to. It's not like I know what other venue owners are making um, because I don't ask and it's none of my business. But did finances not work for you? And that could mean a variety of things. So yes, of course, increasing revenue, but also do you just want to feel more in control of your finances throughout the year? So I was talking to a Venue Academy student and one of the struggles that they were having in 2018 is that they just found themselves spending money at Amazon, at Lowe's, you know, just clicking the button or swiping the card and 
because they needed this improvement thing or they needed this quick thing at Amazon. And oh my gosh, I've been there and I'm still there sometimes, some months of the year. And so do you just want to feel more in control of your finances and know exactly where your money's going? Did that not work for you this year? Um, that's something to to really sit on and figure out. Um, do you need more clients this year? Did that not work for you this year? Are you wanting more clients or maybe just more revenue? Maybe it's not clients. Maybe it's more revenue and you want to think of another revenue stream. So clients or revenue kind of goes in with finances, I think. Did that not work? And then what didn't work? Did you have a lot of client confusion this year? Did you find yourself a little bit frustrated with how many questions your clients were asking? Not because they're not allowed to ask questions, but because you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, if I have to answer this question one more time, I'm going to pull my hair out. (laughs) Did you have client confusion this year? Do you need to plug that hole somewhere? We'll talk about that in a later section in the marketing, or excuse me, in the client process section. But did you have a lot of confusion this year? That's something to really dig into. Go through your emails. What questions were clients asking you? I'll get into those action steps in a little bit. I won't waste your time on that now. But those are some questions to ask yourself. Again, that's not every question. I just wanted to get your brain turning, get your mind going. And I would really encourage you to focus on any data that you can. Uh, For instance, for me, social media, I mean, it's not a science or anything, but I do ask how people heard about us went in our it, two places in our initial inquiry form and uh, that is through Dipsado of course and I also ask on our tour form uh, for through acuity scheduling how they heard about us and I use that that's data right that's data that I can gather it's better than not knowing like I say it's not an exact mathematical equation but and maybe they forgot you know maybe they did see me on Facebook but they put Google because they can't remember either way it's online I don't care and it's better than not knowing 100%. So I can go in and download all of those tour forms and those inquiry forms and see where people are hearing about us and then match that up with who actually booked. So are more people who found us on Facebook actually booking or more people who were referred by a friend or by an acquaintance? You see what I mean? So that helps me understand where I should maybe try to focus more marketing effort, right? Again, it's not an exact science, but it's a heck of a lot better than not knowing at all. And it gives you direction. So that's an example. Okay, let's move into the first section of finances. So I just have a few tips here and then I have a couple actions, an action step. And again, I am not a tax pro, I'm not your CPA, so talk to an actual professional and I'm still learning about finances. These are just things that I have been mulling over myself as we're at the beginning of the year. So first thing that you can do in your finances section, step number one, is of course evaluate your P&L statements, your profit and loss statements. Evaluate where you're investing back into your business. Are you investing back into your business or do you even need to? I do need to because we run a venue and we have chosen to run our venue in a way that it's right now, it's not 100% complete. There's still things we want to add and improve like more landscaping and things like that. So I do have kind of a big investment chunk of our revenue every year to look at and what we choose to invest in. That's for me. If you're a photographer who's been in business for five plus years, you might not have any more investments to make, or maybe you do. Maybe there's a new lens you've been eyeing. Maybe you need to update your camera or your equipment. That's something to look at. Um, Or if you're a wedding planner, are you trying to add rentals to your business? Is that something you want to invest in this year? Did you save for that last year? So P&L statements and investment dollars. And then of course, what are your expenses for this year? Make sure you have those hashed out so that you can operate your business and feel good about it. I always like to, something that makes me feel great about the way we run the venue is that before we pay ourselves, we make sure that we have all of our expenses, uh, put into a different like we don't we don't use our expenses basically we don't say oh we'll book more weddings and then that's how we'll pay for our expenses our expenses for the entirety of 2019 have already been set aside so even if we book zero clients we're not going to pay out additional money to keep the venue running you know what i mean uh, i do we will book additional clients but even if we didn't we can at least cover the expenses of the venue i think that's really important and again i know that's very basic but you know Who knows? Maybe that's something that you've been looking to do, or maybe you're opening up a second arm of your business, or you're opening up a venue this year. I hope those things are helpful to you. Uh, A book I want to recommend to you is a book called Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. 
it's something that we, my husband and I are practicing in our personal finances, and it's something that I really want to practice in our venue finances. I have a partner, so I can't make all of those decisions on my own, but we're pretty aligned on that. And it's been very helpful for us to understand these different buckets that our finances should go in because you know, just having one big bank account with a big dollar amount in it is hard to organize. It's hard for me to organize. It's really helpful for me to organize dollars and see exactly where it's going and have these buckets be allocated for specific things. If you don't need that and you can just look at one big number and know exactly where all of your money is going, that's totally fine. You probably won't get a lot out of that book, but I highly encourage you to read it if it's that seems like something that would be helpful for you. If you hear my pages turning, it's because I made a lot of notes on this episode. Okay, so here are three action steps for you for the finances category of auditing your business. Comb through your bank account and write down all of your subscriptions. All of your subscriptions. Uh, If you're still using a personal account for your business, get a business account. If you are using a business account, either way, doesn't matter, everyone. Comb through your entire bank account and write down every single subscription that you have, including phone apps. You know, did you like quickly purchase a a photo editing app? It's $2.99 a month. Do you have a course hosting uh, um, software like Thinkific? It's $99 a month. Write down everything. And then step two is to now cut something out. Do you need all of those subscriptions? I uh, am guessing you don't. And a lot of us are just, we have that trigger finger like, oh yeah, if I have this subscription, it's going to make me a better business owner. That's not necessarily true, right? And then step number three, after you have combed through your subscriptions, you have cut out the subscriptions you don't need, A, saving yourself money, and B, which is step three, simplifying and systematizing. So if you cut out some subscriptions that you don't need, like if you accidentally purchased five phone editing apps and you're like, okay, I only need one, now you have some extra money. Do you want to divert that to automate and systematize your business more or do you just want to put it away in a savings account? Those are things to decide. I think that subscriptions are becoming so popular and they really are. And, you know, I feel like I did this last year and I had like three subscriptions to different stock photo businesses. And I was like, oh boy, I do not need three different stock photo businesses because basically they're all the same. And I'm sorry, if you have a stock photo business, I don't mean that your work is the same. Please don't DM me. I just mean that you only need one, right? We really only need one. Uh, There's something that I have said on the podcast before, and that is that software and tools don't equal production or success. So many times, I have talked to people from the listeners from the show, and even I've thought myself sometimes, oh, if I have this software, then that means I'm going to be better at business. And I see this a lot, actually, with people who use acuity scheduling. If I have an online scheduler, it means I'm going to be busier. And that's not true. We still have to do the legwork to be to get more clients, to make earn more money, to just do the work. And so when you look at these subscriptions, really evaluate like do you need three stock photo subscriptions does that actually make you a better business owner does that get you where you want to go for me the answer was no it sure doesn't I have downloaded a ton of photos and I really don't need any of these anymore I just need to reuse what I have because it's not a big deal so tools do not equal success or production in business Um, I'll give you some specific examples. When I did step number one, I have over $400 in subscriptions per month going out of my, this is actually for my podcast and my other businesses. This is not for my venue business. Um, That one I have, I feel pretty good about. I only have uh, the necessary subscriptions for that business, but I have over $400 in the podcasting business. One of them was I was subscribed to Animoto twice because I am so unorganized sometimes. And Animoto is a video video software. I love it. But I was subscribed to it twice because I am a rookie. So I obviously got rid of one of those. But and then I cut out a few things. And I'm also looking at ways of further simplifying and systematizing. So I don't have $400 in subscriptions. Um, Another example is where I'm looking to save with those subscriptions is trying to figure out a way to host my podcasting course somewhere else. I like Thinkific, but it only does one thing. And I am really looking for something that will perform multiple functions for me because I have Squarespace, I have Thinkific, and do I need like another cart system? I don't know. So that's something that I'm currently evaluating so that maybe I can cut out that $99 a month or I'm willing to pay a little extra if I can get more out of it where I'm 
paying out other subscriptions too. Uh, so that's something to evaluate. Like, can you increase the cost of a tool if it will do more for you so that you can cut out, you know, four other tools? Because for me, it would be worth it to pay a little bit more for a software if I could cut out managing four other subscriptions. You see what I mean? So at that point, my currency kind of becomes time and management rather than dollars. So that would be worth it to me. So that's something to evaluate for yourself. So that's the finances section. Let's move on to the marketing section. And again, I'm still learning here as well. These are just things that I have been considering for myself. So let's talk about some numbers and some data. And again, I really encourage you to start with this and then move on to, okay, how did that make me feel? Because it is important, especially when it comes to social media. I know I've received a couple of emails from influencers that I follow who are taking a break this month in January from social media entirely. And maybe you know Shanna Skidmore. I, I don't know her, but I you know follow her. And she took an entire year off of social media. So it's clear that feelings do matter, but let's talk about data first and then we'll insert our feelings later. So in marketing, let's start with evaluating social media. We can't get away from it. It does matter or does it? I don't know. You decide. That's the question, right? What social media performs best for you? Are you asking this question on your inquiry forms or your booking forms? Like I said, it's better than not knowing. It may not always be 100% accurate because maybe our clients have seen us a couple times and they forgot where they found us, but we need to gather this data somehow and it's better than not asking. So yes, it's easy, easy peasy, make it a list, make it like a multiple choice question. How did they hear about you? And it will help you at the end of the year, like I say, export that information and see, okay, 80% of our clients found us on Facebook, but more of our clients booked us through acquaintances and referrals. So we are being found on Facebook and that's good for um, that's good for like recognition and brand recognition, but we need to invest more in in-person networking because we got more business dollar wise in the in-person networking. So does that make sense? Okay. Uh, it's important to be able to make an informed decision about this. So that's why I think it's it, it, it's helpful if you're okay, let me back up. I don't want if you're like, oh, crap, I'm not asking any of these questions. That's okay. I think you can probably do a good job of combing through your communication with clients to figure out or at least have a, you know, do a educated guess about how they found you. That's another way to do it. So add that this year ask how people found you. But if you haven't in 2008, if you didn't do that in all of 2018, comb through your past communication and do your best to kind of hypothesize how people found you. I think you'll, I think you'll figure it out. Um, audit your posts that performed well. And again, you can do this in insights in Facebook and Instagram. Audit which ones performed well, which posts people interacted the most with. And again, it's really not about who saw the post. It's more about engagement. So audit that those numbers in your Facebook page insights. Um, Instagram doesn't have as much good data unless you are using paid advertising, but it still has that helpful data. So for instance, if you go into your Instagram insights, you can see um, are women or men interacting with you more? How old are they? What cities are they in? And then what times of day are your audience most active? And that can be helpful to a learn how to, or to um, what time of day your audience is most active with you, that can be helpful information to start testing when you post on Instagram and Facebook and things like that. So for example, when you're auditing posts that perform well with you or well with your audience, does video perform well? Have you posted, did you post some videos this year, whether it be live video, whether it be a video you recorded previously, did that perform well? We all know video performs pretty well, so I'm guessing that it probably did. Should you focus your effort on video? Did they just blow everything else out of the water and maybe even led to some client bookings? So should you really focus on video this year? Uh, have you found success on Instagram? I know Instagram is kind of the, all social media is like the beast we love to hate, but did you find some success there? And again, I really want you to evaluate what that means. And if you're kind of like, oh, I felt so bogged down by Instagram, 
but I did book 10 clients from Instagram this year. Awesome. Then you, since you know that information, obviously Instagram is working for you. And what you need to figure out in 2019 is how to not feel so bogged down by Instagram. I think that scheduling platforms, and I am guilty here, are really underutilized. And yes, it's great to be in the moment and be posting quote authentic content. But honestly, sometimes couples just want us to to know that we're alive. They don't want to see that we haven't posted since September. You know what I mean? They just want to know that we're alive and that we are on those social platforms that they care about. Sometimes that's all it takes for them to shoot us an email, which is where the real magic happens, right? So have you found success on Instagram and how did that work out for you this year? Uh, What goals can you self can you set for yourself that are achievable, which is the key word? What are achievable goals that you can set for yourself when it comes to social media uh, in 2019? So as a, here's an example. If you crushed it in 2018, meaning you were very consistent on your favorite social media platforms, do you maybe need to expand to live video? We know live video is doing well, but if you had an amazing schedule, you never missed a day, you crushed it on social media, maybe it's time to start a live video show for you. Maybe it's time to start posting more video. That feels achievable to me because you're already in the habit of posting consistently on social media. You're seeing success there. So let's start posting really impactful things now, right? Is that Could that be a goal for you? Another example on the opposite side of the scale, and this is my camp, this is kind of where I'm sitting. If you were not 100% consistent this year, then starting a live video show is probably not an achievable goal for you. Let's start with consistency. So should you get a scheduling service and actually use it? You know what I mean? So one of the things I want to encourage here is to maybe look at the cost of getting a virtual assistant, not for the whole year. So don't freak out if you're like, oh, I can't afford a virtual assistant. Just get a one-time project done. And I know you can find someone like this. If you need to schedule out social media and you're like, I have a ton of images, I just want to schedule them out so my couples know that I am alive, I am in business, and I do care. I have beautiful images. I have some, you know, I have a lot to say in the in the comments or the texts of my posts. I just don't want to say it all in the moment on the day because I have other things to focus on then consider hiring a virtual assistant or just somebody who can do a project for you at the beginning of every month. Ask someone, hey, can you schedule out my Facebook and Instagram content at the beginning of every month? I expect it to take you five hours and that's it. And you pay them five hours on a Monday at the beginning of month, at the beginning of the month, and then you're done with them until the next month. That's not a huge cost to incur. And I bet that I'd be willing to bet that you could afford it if it's only five hours. If they're good at their job, it shouldn't take them that long. And it's something that would give you so much peace of mind and your clients and potential clients would know, oh, Kinsey's alive. Look at her posting. I love these photos. I love that idea for a cake table. I can't wait to talk to her about it. You know what I mean? Sometimes the value in just showing up is better than showing up and, and letting clients know that you're there is better than, oh, I'm not quote inspired to post today, so I'm just not going to. I will venture to guess that our clients and potential clients are not like, oh, Kinsey's just not inspired today. That's okay. No, no, no. They want to see that I'm showing up, even if it means I'm showing up in an automated way. And I don't mean automated. My personality isn't automated. Just because you are scheduling comments or scheduling your um Guys, I can't think of the word today. Just because you're scheduling like the description of your posts doesn't mean it's not authentic in that moment. It just means you're organized. Okay, so stop trying to be, quote, inspired all of the time and sometimes just show up for your people. Okay, I'm going to continue on. That was marketing. I know we focused a lot on social media and the subsequent episodes of this series for 2019. I'm going to dig in specifically to marketing and other strategies, including how to get more clients in 2019. I just wanted to start in one place because marketing is a whole barrel of worms that we could just, there's so many things to talk about. So start there because we're auditing, we're trying to be organized. Let's start there. Now, Let's move on to the client process. And I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, for me, the client process is onboarding, nurturing. That means they've booked with you and we have kind of a long client life cycle. So at least we do at the venue. And so that's nurturing. And then of course, offboarding. So do these areas feel smooth and seamless for you? 
And more importantly, do they feel smooth and seamless for your client? And the only way to know that is to ask. Uh, You could probably tell if they seem really scratchy and really kind of like there's a lot of humps to overcome for yourself and for your clients. If they feel that way to you, they feel that way for your client. So evaluate your client process, the onboarding process, the nurturing process, and the offboarding process. Do those feel smooth and seamless? Do you feel like you're serving your clients well in those areas? And then list out how you're serving them. So if they feel like they're going good, how are you serving your clients in each of those areas to make them Um, more likely to refer you, right? So let's think of, let's like set a goal for your client process. Is the goal for them to just love you and give you a review and never think of you again, but great, you have that review. Or is the goal of your whole process to, for them to love you, for them to have an amazing freaking day with you, give you a review and refer you right? So what's the goal there? And then take another look at your client process. Are you doing things to achieve that goal? So um, is there anything you want to change? Do you need to edit? Do you need to add anything to these processes? Again, think of what your goal is for your whole process, right? I, I think sometimes I do, I do this all the time. I'm, I'm so, op- I'm a quick start. So I'm so operating in the moment sometimes because I learn fast and I just execute quickly. And I'm like, cool, here's your information. See you next year. Just kidding. I do talk to our clients more, but you know, sometimes that feels that way to me because I'm just so consumed with other things, right? We just talked about two other sections, finances and marketing. And we only talked about one part of marketing, which was social media. And that feels like a lot. So as business owners, we do have a lot to consider, especially if you have a small team or no team. I have a no team. It's just Katie and myself at the venue. So, and you're probably some, you're similar, right? It's you and a family member or you and your business partner or your spouse or whoever it is. So let's talk about, let's talk about that. We need to get that goal in place for our whole client process. Like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this for these people? It's not just because we love to take pictures or we love to host weddings or we love to plan parties. What do we want at the end of this client life cycle? And whatever you want at the end of that client life cycle, does that align with how you are treating people when you onboard them, as you nurture them, and as you offboard them? Those are the questions to ask yourself. So here's some examples then. Here's an action step. Look back at all of your client communication in 2018. I hope you're saving your client communication in your emails. And are there a lot of questions? Are there, sorry, let me rephrase. Did multiple couples ask the same questions of you? Did you have a lot of the same question? So did 10 couples, let's say you served 50 couples, did 10 to 20 couples all ask you when their deposit was due? or their second half of their deposit, this is just an example. Cool, that means there's a disconnect somewhere in your communication and it's on you to fix it. If you, that's a lot of time wasted, that's 20 emails that you probably didn't have to answer. If you would automate that communication in a way that makes them feel taken care of and communicated with, not only could you automate the reminder, but you could also automate getting paid. I implemented this at the beginning of last year. I started in Dubsado. I've just really dug into workflows, automated reminders, and I send a reminder out like a week in advance and just say, hey, this is coming up your second half of your venue deposit. We get paid a lot of times in advance or most of the time on time, or if they get that automated email and they're struggling, they contact us. I'm not chasing down payments. I did have to chase down some payments last year. And then I was like, okay, no, I don't want to do this anymore. It's not foolproof. Of course, you're going to have to chase down payments or that's just an example, but it's helpful. It's helpful to automate those things because your ideal clients are going to pay you, right? So that's just a question. That's just an example. Did you have a lot of people ask when their next deposit was due? Do you need to include specific dates in your contract? I, When I was listening to uh, Christina Scalera speak at Creative at Heart back in November, and I think I mentioned this in the last episode, I just loved what she said about contracts because it was, it just, she just articulated it so well. And about contracts, she said they are a way of preserving the relationship. I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, but essentially she said, contracts are a way of preserving a relationship and being an excellent communicator. 
It's not about having a slimy contract with a bunch of legal language that people can't understand. It's about communicating upfront with people, and that might include actual dates. So in HoneyBook, in Dubsado, are you autom- are you populating the actual date that things are due? So if you are a fellow venue owner, do you have the physical, do you just say your deposit is due six months before your wedding? Or is the actual date that it's due in that contract, in addition to having an email reminder workflow set up? and an automated invoice in their client portal. So that's a question for everyone. Okay, I'm done. Oh my gosh. Okay, went through all of my notes. So I hope this was helpful to audit parts of your business. Next time in episode 126, we're going to talk about how to get more clients in your wedding business in 2019. These are things that I've been thinking about. I want to get more clients in 2019 and beyond. I also just want to simply increase my revenue. And I have some ideas for all of us on how we can do that because there's, you know, there's so many amazing ways we can grow our businesses and it doesn't always have to equal hiring people or having more weddings. And I want to share the things I'm doing with you and I want to share a new project I have. So that will be in episode 126, how to get more clients in your wedding business in 2019 and how to increase your revenue in other ways will be the episode that follows that. Thank you very much for listening today. I want you to share your feedback with me. DM me on Instagram or tag me whatever on whenever you're auditing your business. And I can't wait to see what you uncover. I know I've uncovered a lot and I have a lot of work to do in the off season. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to She Creates Business. Please take a minute and head to iTunes to leave an honest review so we can help more wedding pros find the show.